there. Where? Here. A small step for mankind, but a giant step for us. There was that recent episode, I, I don't know the particulars, but Doe had apparently um, had some kind of suicidal episode, and this was publicly known. Um, it's not related to the conversation at hand, but I think in light of that, to the extent that RGR can be expected to be aware of it, and I think she can be, um, because again, like she was making these accusations, or insinuations if you prefer, in the same medium, to the same account. She's in the orbit of the people who were uh, really aggressing on, on Doe politically, or, or I guess on, on Twitter or whatever, uh, when this went down. Um, something like that will seriously affect your ability to absorb events like a very public insinuation that you are... Everything that Riley is saying here codes uh, Doe to the extent that it sticks to Doe. Um, codes Doe as a f morally equivalent to a pedophile. It's very hard to come back from that. If you're, if you're a, f uh, if, if, if you are feeling great, that can, that can knock you down so hard. Um, because I don't think there's a, there's a more, uh, hated, uh, category of person. Um, and crucially, it's not an entirely unjustly despised category of person. We're not talking about just, like, we're not talking about someone who just has an unusual kink. We're talking about someone who's, um, who's, whose fetish or orientation, whatever you want to describe it as, is inherently harmful and immoral to enact almost objectively. That is to say, like, from almost every single vantage. Um, so being coded that way publicly, that is that is a pit that is very, very hard to, almost impossible to climb out of if it sticks. So much hinged on Doe's uh, performance here. That's how dangerous this is. Like, if this had happened to somebody who was more nervous and less controlled and had less command, it could have been a disaster. Be destroyed, yeah. Yeah, oh, you're they... back. Back, yeah. Yeah. Um, surely... RGR would have known that those were the stakes. Like That's I, I really you're, you're probably chills me. You're probably one of the most intelligent people I know, if not the. I don't know how you would have would have handled this. I, yeah, I think I probably would have just cried, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> like I think it would have it would have I or or been in a yelling match at one point. By the way, the nature and level of what was being accused. Do you remember who RGR is? Because we've discussed this person before. I, I'm assuming there's some specific important detail here that I'm not recollecting, so it's, it's, remind me. It, it qualifies this in a, in a rather sad way. So you remember that conversation we had with Booksmarts a while back. I, I referenced that earlier in the stream. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about Demon Mama acting not nice to RGR. And what did Demon Mama do? Well, Demon Mama insinuated when it seemed like there was some kind of conceptual disagreement and neither party was really up to the task of clarifying themselves and egos were on the line. She said when it was a particularly invidious thing to do, uh, you're being cringe, you're acting sort of like Destiny right now, implying like some fairly serious moral defect. Um, and this was a big deal. RGR was reduced to tears. This became like a big part of her her move to um, distancing herself from a whole lot of online associations. Um, there there was an endless amount of uh, of critiques of Demon Mama for this um, by some very high large uh, very high profile people in this in this sphere. I I was critical of that as well. Um, and then she pulls this. Like, I just, I just can't even imagine a world in which somebody who was that sensitive to criticism by dint of being compared to an unfavorable actor would then turn around and just brutally character assassinate someone unless they were cynical. Yeah. Like, it's hard to believe that. It makes you think that everything from prior to this was crocodile tears, bluntly. Like, it makes you, it makes you. You took. Her it's funny. Actions. You you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that exactly with respect to the. Um, the uh, the hand bringing about people going to the activist org that she's a part of, 
It's like, oh no. Like, do you have any, do you have any fucking clue as to the gravity of what she tried to pull here? This could have killed somebody. Um, I don't know if you were it's present. It's honestly stunning. I don't know if you were present uh, earlier, but uh, some uh, Katsumi uh, pointed out that this is actually uh, right on the tail end of um, a, a fairly well uh, publicized, not like by mainstream media, but like on, on Twitter and whatnot, uh, suicidal episode, or even a suicide attempt, I'm not clear on the particulars that uh, Doe had gone through, um, that you had people as high profile as uh, Destiny mocking publicly. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of people here. Um, that is going to severely impact your ability to absorb something like this. One thing I don't understand is I know that there's different... How do I put it? Um, I have to be really careful how to frame this. In different arenas, different social norms obtain, right? So there's different kind of standards and conduct or behavior. There's never a place or space where it's acceptable to mock somebody's suicidality like that's just not acceptable um there's never a space or place where it's acceptable just to character assassinate someone like these should be just common standards like basic standards across every platform every industry every situation especially one where thousands and thousands of people are viewing this and witnessing this in an immediate sense so and by the way i don't know yeah and by the way it's absurd yeah e even if um even if you doubt the sincerity of the account, because there will be somebody whose account appears the same that is legitimate. It exactly. is it is distinctly possible that somebody, and I'm not saying that's this is the case here, I don't believe that for a second, but it is distinctly possible that somebody feigns a suicide attempt or suicidality for pity. That is a thing we can do. Like, let's, let's be realistic here. That is a thing human beings are capable of contriving. It's immaterial. Um, because... The presentation may nonetheless match the legitimate thing. And if you're going off of the presentation only to discount the one, you are in effect discounting the other. This is one of the reasons the why it's so important not to go after people's appearance. Or things in, like in that. In a way that's completely non-trivial and actually shows the, I don't know how to describe it, like the deep moral weight I give these theories. It's why when you look at philosophical views and analyze things in terms of their actual causal effects, that's an extremely yeah. important part of the equation. Because... You can have, you need to start thinking about it, the case in which, what, how it's going to affect other actors. Like, you might have a reason to believe that something is spurious, but when you look at the effect of treating it as if it's spurious when it turned out not to be, what are the consequences of that compared to doing the opposite, right? So, it's kind of, um, things have to be taken seriously. And I just, I guess there's this mentality that everything is acceptable if it somehow leads to clout. But that's just not true, because where's the person at the other end of that? I know we've had that discussion before, right? So well, in addition, like, we're, we're talking we're talking about this, like, Doe just came out on top, and it was, like, no harm, no foul, just because of, of its, 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 its strength of character. But that's not necessarily true either. Um, Doe could very well still be, like, dealing with the psychological after effects of this, um... People have Inevitably. people have observed what appear to be like, despite like again, very strong performance, very admirable performance, nonetheless, um, tells that there was a lot of stress going on, or, or potentially, it's yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think, and again, like I think that what we've done is we've we've come out in favor of her side by trying to you know as carefully as possible in the circumstances you know, argue for what's actually going on here and the distinction between a thought and an act and all the other, you know, important moral questions, which in no way is to assume that she's not heavily and deeply impacted by it. Kind of the opposite, right? Yeah. Um, we're taking every part of this seriously. Um, it's just, it's just because people don't always have a style where they showcase. So to go back earlier, like, yeah, I, might, I would probably have a, a worse reaction than her, but even then, let's say that I didn't, doesn't mean that it, I wouldn't be affected by these, by horrendous accusations. Like that's, that's something that you can't judge based on someone's outward presentation, right? Well, RGR likes moralizing, you know, declarations. So, so here's one. Um, she basically decided on the most spurious of grounds to destroy a potentially suicidal person's reputation publicly for nothing. Like, what? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> like, just, just not, disappear at that which... point. Like, what, what, what do you even, how, how do you even, like, how do you remedy that except for just shutting everything down and going private? There's a point at which the person's inability to moral, to moral, like, to social, to moral. They're inability to moral. There, that's the end of it. Um, we're at the end. <laughs> to understand. Yeah, exactly. We're at the end. I think we were standing. Well, you're they're, at the end. I've got another into... thing to watch after this. Continue. <laughs> oh, okay. congrats. I heard it's related to Destiny too. So, you know, apropos. Distribute but, us um... even better. Oh, sorry. Jesus. God damn. All the D's, you know, lined up and the PPs and the rest of them. Um, so, basically, <laughs> there's a sense in which this person's inability to track the moral and social stakes is literally an inability to think. Like, the two aren't separable. It's not like, oh, yeah, I really did this good job at, you know, spinning a story that had some internal logic to it, and now I won. And as a result of winning, in this little internal logic, you know, logical sense, I'll get a, I'll get a bunch of clout. It's going to go well. Like, it's going to go well for me now. And it's like, no, like, you're literally not thinking at the point at which, like, that is an irrelevant feature of your thought. So I hate people like, oh, people can be smart who are psychopathic or sociopathic, and no. I'm not accusing any one of that. Yeah. But the point is that they can't, because if you're not considering the moral stakes or the interpersonal stakes of what you're doing, then you're not behaving in an intelligent or reasonable way. Like, by the way, stop, right? so. maybe to wind down, because we were going to talk about this and then we just went on and on with this thing, which I guess was to be expected given along the stream is that we're looking at. Um, but we were going to talk briefly about the dark academia thing, because you're starting to read or you're going to read at some point um, the secret history, which I've read, which is really good. But we wanted to talk about that whole like the uh, the aestheticization of like the the association of of like academic learning and and like all that cultural depth and whatnot with like specific modes of dress and and specific like aesthetics and, and artistic choices that are arbitrarily chosen to us be associated with that so it's kind of reinforcing um what's your yeah. what's your what's your drunken exhausted hot take on that uh, I mean, this is something that I kind of want to delve into when I'm not in that Me state. Um, and I, I lack your stamina on stream. So, you know, at two hours, I kind of start to go loopy. I'm but, faking it. Um, I, yeah, make it to make it. I think, um, look, what is academia leaving a lot of people aesthetically? A horrible mishmash of feudalism and late capitalism. So that is not an environment in which people would be stimulated or willing to do academic work, which no matter how, how do I put it, um, outcome oriented you are, or what's the term they use? They like outcome oriented students is the term they use for people who are concerned about grades and, you know, going into a specific stream and maybe they have reason to be concerned by those things. That's legitimate. Um, you're not going to be inspired by an environment in which there is zero dialogue zero ability or space or room to comfortably sit and work and learn and absolutely zero energy for or investment in the past um there's a sort of silly aspect of analytic philosophy that says that anything that isn't contemporary is history of philosophy but from a continental standpoint or anyone else's standpoint that history is pivotal to understanding anything about philosophy and that history takes on a dialogical form. It's the history of people talking to people and recording them and professors remembering other professors, remembering other professors saying things. And yes, this is all very like elitist and inaccessible and difficult, but there's ways of making that accessible that don't just hollow out the heart of these institutions. And, and the alternative is bureaucrats feeding you things and overworked, underpaid people who are basically desperate. Um, makes you wish there was other things they could have done to overcome that elitism. So yeah, the environment sucks. No wonder people are doing this. And I don't think the aestheticization is as dire or toxic or problematic as the original environment, bluntly. So I am yeah. actually quite sympathetic to younger generation doing I, this. I, don't, I do not have a problem with like younger people like deciding to dress in vests and have like leather bound books they bought for $40 on Amazon um, because it makes them feel good and it makes the world less ugly around them. And frankly, if like, for God's sake, I play video games primarily to enchant fields of study that I'm exhausted with. 
and it helps me. I work. got through Derrida by by playing Twilight Princess and wandering around like the equivalent of Kokiri Forest in that game. It was like twelve years ago, and that's how I learned yeah. about the medical self implicature. Because God, I wasn't sitting down just reading that to myself. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is they're learning, right? So they're not just sitting in a vest and buying books to make their life more enchanting, which is fine and fair enough. They're actually reading. They're reading those books. They're engaging with each other. They're using their time to spend in these circles talking about things to each other and even if they're not getting access to formal authorities or that sort of thing there's productive conversations that are coming out of that so now they're being obnoxious the, about it <laughs> yeah, but that's but, it, but everybody who's young who does anything that they think is worthwhile is going to be obnoxious that's not unique to anybody unless you're logo daedalus <laughs> oh man um <laughs> unless somebody starts reading though like all of ulysses on streams and that's all they ever do then then i might that that's a limit that i tried and reached. i realized like i i can understand that there was like a lot of like you know erudition and skill that went into that i can't i can't do it i can't i've tried i mean i've gotten like i've gotten like 200 pages like, into it and i'm just like what the hell am i doing i just disagree that he's a great author when you get to oxen of the sun and then the lecture feminine stuff is just odious like i don't know i just i hate it, it it's fine it's it's lecture feminine is a you know legitimate moby movie. dick is so much more interesting and it's actually fun to read and it's not just like you get more out of it than just oh look there's layered references actually the lecture feminine which is what i'm gonna end this on which is like feminine writing style is um probably the most this illustrates my point the best because that could have been so awesome that could have been this kind of silly to some people's eyes, but really important at the time and still important for people um, getting beneath the words. And, you know, it's this essentialist, but like second wave feminist restyling of what it means to be a woman by lapsing into seeming incoherence, but really being super poetic. Sure. Like it's a great meta activity. It seems interesting. It seems cool. When Joyce does it, 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 it comes out like from in speaking in Molly Bloom's voice, it doesn't, stick like it's it's kind of awful i mean that's my that's my very deeply subjective opinion about this and granted I, there's 15 years separating me from this thing at this point but there's so much in joyce that could have hit so well and just didn't have the impact that it could have had um to the reader on an immediate level which is fine maybe you need to be spending time digging in and having a, a side volume that's 1500 pages just to get through ulysses and that's the way you should do it i just um, feel like like I don't know. There, there are just other things you could be spending that time on, and I realize I, I know how that closet. sounds. I know how that sounds, but it's like, um, I, I see these people who have like these these annotated multiple copies of Ulysses. And it's like, you know, you could have you could have read like all of Hegel in that time, all of Kant. Like you could have you could you could have been brilliant. Instead, it's like, let me tell you about how good this novel is that you really won't like until you spent about two years figuring out the nuances and you've got so little of your soul left. This is all you find pleasure in anymore. I re that's, that's not fair, but like, it's just, I can't that's do not it. to disregard art or literature or the value of either. And there's philosophical value in literature that can't be gotten out of philosophy. And there's philosophy that basically counts as literature. Hey, right? you know what? You read it because of its literary value. So I like the first chapter of Ulysses and then that's it. But I liked it. <laughs> I liked the first little bit with like, um, uh, shoot, what's his name? Buck Mulligan with his, like, thing, the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea. Oh, yeah, of course, of course, and of then, course. I'm just thinking, I'd go and read it, but I have to reread, you know, the social contract, and I'll Kant now just to have a conversation with you, so ah. thanks for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is everything else off my plate. Forget Percy. Or, forget Hume, forget or Russell, Dune. I still, I managed to read, like, no less than two volumes of Hegel in the amount of time it's taken me to get halfway through Dune. There's some good, for the audience too, there's some good memes on trying to read Dune. Like, people who do, like, TikToks on, like, well, I decided to start reading Dune. Spent about 50 hours. I still don't really know what's happening. Um, I think I prefer Timothy Chalamet wandering in the desert at this rate, which was exhausting enough. But, yeah. Although, I'm being okay. sold on War and Peace, because apparently he's got, like, an entire thing on, like, philosophy of history in that book, and it's really interesting. Anyways, you have work to do, and it's late, so I'm going to let you go. Um, yes. let people know who you are quickly because uh, you're starting a channel soon because I'm forcing you to yes and that channel will eventually get populated within a few months and so we're, we're excited about this um, my name is Jelma Bayorn that's my name and I'm also known as Ambrose and I run the server The Cathedral that has amazing content creators in it like President Sunday and Zanzi and Victor Maharino 
um, who hasn't been around for a while, actually. Um, but he's amazing. Check him out. And I am considering starting my own channel as well. So, uh, yes, please uh, check me out. Check Sunday out. And uh, it's been great being on the office hours. Yeah, thank you very much, especially since you're the only one of the two of us who actually has an office that uh, was kind of cool for you to, <laughs> to visit. You mean that, that broom closet I share with seven people I can never access again because it's like thousands of miles away? Yeah, that. I mean, this is a facade. <laughs> this is a bookshelf in my living room. So... <laughs> Staring at that gives me more joy. See, it's dark academia. There we go. This is an instantiation of dark academia right here. Exactly. Except the, your fireplace needs to work. The most, you'll agree with me on this, the most aesthetically accurate to, like, the actual, like, kind of thing that they are, the most aesthetically accurate academic in existence right now is Slavoj Žižek. That's what they look like. I was like. going to say that. That's yeah. That's literally what it's like, and that's that's what the environment's like. That's it's all Zizek. We're we're tired and unhealthy, and we're sniffling constantly. That's that's how it is. <laughs>